My name is Peter Timoney. I'm a faculty member and a professor at the, in the Department of Veterinary Science at the Gluck Equine Research Center at the University of Kentucky. Um, I am a veterinarian and I've had an interest in infectious diseases of horses for over 35 years. Further to my serving as a faculty member at the Gluck Equine Res Research Center at the University of Kentucky, I am a OIE designated specialist on equine arteritis, arteritis virus and I have been so for the last 25 plus years. In other words, we're one of two world reference centers on this particular virus and this disease. And I happen to be the OIE or World Organization for Animal Health designated specialist on this particular disease. Since 1983, I worked with one particular virus, equine arteritis virus, and been involved in natural outbreaks of that particular uh, virus infection, and also experimental studies aimed at learning more about the epidemiology and the biology of this particular uh, disease. Um, equine viral arteritis is one of three equine viral pathogens. The other two being equine influenza and equine herpes virus type 1 or type 4. Of those three, equine arteritis virus is a contagious agent, but it's not as highly contagious as either influenza virus or indeed equine herpes virus 1 or 4. However, nonetheless, it is a very important virus and differs from those two other viruses in one significant respect. In the case of influenza virus or equine herpes viruses 1 and 4, spread of those viruses occurs specifically by the respiratory route. In other words, horses exposed to them can become acutely infected and shed the respective viruses into the respiratory tract secretions and transmission occurs by direct contact between an infected animal and a susceptible or naive horse or one that's suboptimally protected, that has been vaccinated but has not enough protection to offset exposure and reinfection with the virus. Equine arteritis virus is different. During the acute phase of the infection, it also is spread via the respiratory route. And this applies whether you're talking about either foals, yearlings, mares, geldings, stallions, colts, it doesn't matter. It's exactly the same infectious cycle. And during that infectious cycle, this virus circulates in the bloodstream, infects many tissues throughout the body, and stimulates a very strong protective immune response in the infected animal. That strong immune response results in the development of neutralizing antibodies amongst other things and the animal itself having gone through the acute phase in the infection will spontaneously clear infection from its body from all of the tissues. The one exception is the stallion or the sexually mature intact cold where this virus can persist after the acute phase of the infection has um, is over and the virus can persist in certain of the accessory sex glands in the reproductive tract and is responsible for setting up the establishment of a persistent or carrier state. That carrier state can be very short term, can be for several weeks upon the conclusion of the acute phase of the infection, it can be for several months and then the animal clears itself of the virus or indeed it can be for a year or longer and in some cases for many many years even the lifespan of the infected animal. So you can see this is very different especially from equine influenza virus where the carrier state does not exist after infection with that virus. In the case of equine herpes viruses 1 and 4 the carrier state does exist as a latent carrier state in certain tissues and in certain ganglia associated with the central nervous system. But that's different. It's a different form of carrier state from that that you find with the equine arteritis virus. 
Now, if we talk about the acute phase of the infection, during that phase and the first and foremost, the incubation period before the animal starts to shed virus is usually up to two to three days following exposure via the respiratory route. But in the case of exposure via the venereal route, either through natural service or through artificial insemination with infective semen, the incubation period is usually one week, between six and eight days. That incubation period then is followed by a period during which the, the virus itself multiplies in the lymphoreticular tissues in the body of the horse and circulates in the bloodstream. That blood carries the virus to all the tissues in the body. It stimulates a very strong immune response, but the virus is shed into the respiratory tract and also in urine. It's also shed into the reproductive tract and also to some extent it can be shed into the conjunctival secretions of the tears of the acutely infected horse. However, that shedding period is relatively short. It can extend from 7 up to 14, maybe 17 days, and then it ceases. The circulation of the virus in the bloodstream can last for approximately the same period of time, perhaps even up to 21 days after infection has been initiated and then that virus disappears from the system and that disappearance coincides with the development of a maximal immune response in the infected horse. So once the immune response is mounted, it basically heralds the end of both the viremia and the shedding of the virus in different secretions and excretions of the acutely infected animal. Now to move through and speak more fully about the carrier state, I've already mentioned that there are three forms of the carrier state. A short-term or convalescent form that lasts two to five weeks, an intermediate form where the persistence of the virus lasts for anything between three and eight months and then disappears, and then the third is the long-term carrier state where the virus is present and can be shed for many, many years. Not all carriers, though, long-term carriers, will necessarily remain persistently infected for life. Some will spontaneously clear the virus from the reproductive tract. Under circumstances, we're not yet exactly certain why or how this is accomplished, but it does happen. The chronically infected carrier stallion differs significantly from the acutely infected stallion insofar as the virus is not circulating in the bloodstream, even though it's persisting in certain of the accessory sex glands, especially in the expanded terminal glandular portions of the vasodeferensia, or the vas deferens, those tubular structures that lead from the testis, the epididymis of the horse, down to the um, seminal vesicles and the prostate gland and the bulbary urethra glands. But the terminal portion of the vas deferens in the carrier stallion is called the ampulla. And that ampulla in the horse is glandular. It produces secretions. And that is the site where this virus is harbored in the carrier animal. It's primarily in the ampulla on both sides, since we're dealing with the paired organ of the animal. And there it survives. And every time a stallion is used for breeding purposes, either for natural service or for semen collection. The virus is shed into the semen. It's not present in the pre-ejaculate. It's only present in the sperm-rich fraction of the ejaculate. And that's important if you're screening a stallion for the presence of the carrier state. You must secure the sperm-rich fraction of the ejaculate to optimize your chances of detection of the virus. So much so for the sites of persistence. I've already mentioned in the carrier stallion, the virus does not circulate in the bloodstream. We've attempted to demonstrate its presence absolutely unsuccessfully. So you do not get an associated viremia with the presence of the carrier state, unlike the acute phase of the infection, where there is a viremia and the virus is circulating freely in the bloodstream. 
Furthermore, because of that, there is no shedding of this virus, equine arteritis virus, in any secretion or excretion except semen. So it's not present in respiratory secretions, it's not present in conjunctival secretions or tears, it's not shed in fecal material, and it's not shed in urine. So the only time at which the carrier stallion can act as a source of infection is when it is used for breeding purposes. Whether that breeding is, as I say, via natural cover or natural service, or for semen collection, and if the appropriate precautions are not taken, then there is certainly the potential risk of indirect transmission of this virus through contaminated fomites or objects, such as an artificial vagina or a phantom that's in a it's not properly decontaminated or disinfected between collection of stallions. So it's a highly controllable infection in respect of the carrier animal. We know a great deal about this infection. We know that it is possible to vaccinate against it. There is a modified live virus vaccine that's been available for 25 to 30 years. It's been proven to be totally safe for use in stallions and in non-pregnant mares. It's effective, it stimulates a very high level of protective immunity and that immunity is very durable. It lasts for many, many years following even a single administration of the vaccine, just the same as it does following natural exposure and infection with the virus. So we're very fortunate that we have the means to prevent and to control dissemination or spread of this virus at time of breeding even if we are breeding carrier stallions. The important thing is to realize, number one, are you dealing with a carrier stallion or not? In other words, it's important to test your stallion first and foremost, if you've never tested them, to blood sample them and have a diagnostic test undertaken on the blood sample, specifically the serum, and to determine are there antibodies present against this virus in that serum or not. If there are antibodies and that stallion is considered to be serologically positive for antibodies to this virus, then it behooves you to basically collect semen, ensuring that you collect the sperm-rich fraction of the ejaculate and submit that sample to a laboratory that has proven competency and experience in detecting this virus. It's not the easiest virus in some instances if you're attempting isolation of the virus, but using more modern uh, molecular techniques such as the polymerase chain reaction and is possible to basically detect the virus readily by most labs. But it is important to make sure that the lab has prior experience and proven competency in the diagnosis of this infection. If you find that that sample is negative, that there's no evidence of viral nucleic acid or genetic material or infectious virus, then indeed your stallion is categorized as a serologically positive, non-shedding, non-carrier stallion and can breed. You can breed them with impunity to any mare, whether that mare is naive or fully susceptible, in other words, serologically negative for antibodies to equine arteritis virus, or indeed one that's serologically positive. And um, so, in essence, then, there are no restrictions on breeding a serologically positive stallion that's a non shedder and non carrier. If, on the other hand, you're dealing with a carrier stallion that is always serologically positive. We have never encountered serologically negative carrier stallions, although some of them may carry a very, very low level of positivity. However, the virus is always present in the semen of carrier stallions, and it's important to recognize that, and also important to recognize that the amount of virus that can be present in the semen of some stallions can be as much as 1 million to 10 million infectious units
per ml of seminal plasma. So it's not hard to uh, accept that in fact, using such semen, you can very effect effectively and efficiently transfer infection either through natural service or through the use of artificial insemination to a naive mare. So, in dealing with the carrier stallion, it is important to segregate them on a breeding premises to manage them, observing the appropriate management precautions to make sure that there is no possibility of indirectly or directly being responsible for transmission of infection by the semen from a carrier stallion to other stallions or other categories of horses. The question arises, does a carrier stallion represent a risk of transmission of this virus if indeed it is moved and in fact is allowed to attend to show or to compete at a curing or other event? There is no risk associated with that animal being shown or indeed attending such an event, specifically because the animal is not being used for breeding purposes and consequently there is no opportunity for the virus to be shed into the environment by that animal. So the misperception that a carrier stallion represents a risk of lateral transmission of this virus just because he is a carrier is not necessarily the case. That stallion is only a risk if used for breeding purposes, not if it is not. In other words, absence of uh, contact with the genitalia of that stallion, more specifically with the ejaculate of that stallion, ensures that that stallion can be used and can be shown without fear or risk of lateral transmission and spread of this virus. It's important to recognize that this virus is significant, not alone in that it can cause a clinical syndrome, and that syndrome is called equine viral arteritis, but also because if this virus is introduced into a band of naive or susceptible pregnant mares, anywhere between two months gestation through to term, it can cause abortion, insignificant abortion. Furthermore, some mares exposed very late in gestation or pregnancy may become infected and the virus passes across the placenta and infects the foal in utero and the foal is born congenitally infected at time of birth. Those foals do not survive. They suffer from a fulminant viral pneumonitis just similar to and uh, that that occurs in a similar situation or analogous situation with equine herpes virus type 1 infection. So they do not survive and it's the kindest thing to do and the most humane thing is basically to euthanize them because we have no specific antiviral treatment that would eliminate, much less treat, the underlying pneumonia that these animals experience. The third and final problem associated with this virus is, aside from the disease that it can cause, aside from the fact that it can cause abortion in pregnant mares, or indeed congenital infection, fulminant infection in neonatal young foals, is the fact that this virus can cause persistence of the carrier state in a variable percentage of exposed naive stallions. That percentage rate, in other words, the frequency of the carrier state, varies between breeds. Some breeds, such as the standard bred breed, in which the virus infection tends to be endemic, can have very high carrier rates. Similarly, with regard to various warm blood breeds, other breeds, such as the thoroughbred, have a very low frequency of the carrier state. So it does vary, but the important thing is that the owner, the breeder, responsible for a breeding stallion should always check that stallion to ensure that the stallion itself, which will appear clinically normal, there will be no clinical signs exhibited by such an animal, is tested serologically and if its serum, its blood is negative for antibodies, that's fine then the question arises, should you vaccinate that stallion to protect it 
should it be exposed subsequently to this virus and run the risk of becoming a carrier? My feeling is, yes, you should. On the other hand, if you test the blood, uh, the serum of the statin and find it's positive, then I feel in the absence of any history of prior vaccination, you should have the semen screened and tested for the presence of virus. If the virus is not present or not detected, then that statin is fine. It's a strongly protected animal and can be used with impunity on naive mares, fully susceptible mares, as well as serologically positive mares. If, on the other hand, it turns out to be a carrier, then, in fact, there are precautions that need to be taken in terms of management, handling of that animal, especially with respect to breeding. A number of years ago, a significant number of years ago, the USDA brought out a video and then subsequently a DVD specifically with respect to this particular disease and the cause of the agent. And it was described as an entirely manageable disease and a manageable infection, and that is indeed the case. We know a huge amount about the biology of the cause of virus, a huge amount about the factors involved in the spread of it, how to prevent it, how to control it. And there's absolutely no reason for misinformation to be promulgated and to be spread that, in fact, carrier statins of themselves pose a risk of spreading this virus if indeed they're shown at a horse shows or at participate in couriers. There's no scientific basis for that misperception. If a breeding facility has a carrier stallion and knows that the stallion in question is persistently infected with the equine arteritis virus, then it is important that that breeding facility or the management of that facility should inform mare owners wishing to avail of a cover or a service to that stallion of the status of their stallion, specifically to avoid the potential for a stallion um, or a mare being inseminated with virus infective semen and the mare owner being totally unaware of the fact that that mare herself will experience, if she's fully susceptible and has never been previously vaccinated against this infection, will develop an acute phase infection. And that acute phase of this infection will result in shedding of the virus by the respiratory route and by other routes. If that mare happens to be turned out at pasture with pregnant mares, and they are also naive, there is certainly the risk of direct contact and lateral transmission of the virus and the potential risk of abortion. Has that occurred? Yes, it has occurred. Similarly, if that mare is turned out in the field and has across the fence contact with pregnant mares, again that transmission can occur via the respiratory route between the acutely infected mare that's been recently inseminated and is going through the acute phase of the infection and those other mares that are already pregnant and one presumes are naive, when I use the word naive, I mean fully susceptible and have never been previously exposed or infected with this virus. So it is important. Communication needs to occur between the owner of a carrier stallion and any mare owner or breeder who wishes to breed their mare with semen from that stallion or indeed to breed their mare naturally to that stallion. An additional factor that needs to be borne in mind that there is a commercial trade in respect of the importation of cryopreserved semen from Europe into the United States. And the United States is the only one of all the world's horse breeding and racing countries in the world that has zero import restrictions on the importation either of equine arteritis virus carrier stallions, much less semen that's infective with this virus. So consequently, stallions can be purchased ostensibly negative non-carriers based on pre-purchase examination and testing and subsequently arrive in this country and to the chagrin of the newfound owner, 
they test that stallion for the presence of equine arteritis virus and find that he is indeed a carrier and a shedder of this virus. That has occurred in the past and it could occur in the future. So it is important to ensure that every precaution is taken, that in fact what you purchase outside of this country, especially in certain northern European countries, is what it is purported to be. In other words, that you just don't have a veterinary certificate of health, but you have the assuredness that in fact the animal has been reliably tested for this infection and shown to be a non-shedder and a non-carrier of this virus. If similarly with regard to imported semen, that semen is imported, it's not tested at time of importation. Stalin collection centres within the European Union member states are meant to observe certain precautions with respect to ensuring that the stallions that stand there are indeed checked and confirmed to be non-carriers of this virus. Does it always happen? Not necessarily. Similarly, if you import semen not from a semen collection centre that's under the aegis of the uh, supervision of the National Veterinary Authority in the country in which the stallion is located, but from a private farm, breeding farm, you gain you run the risk that in fact that semen could be coming from a stallion and that stallion could be shedding virus that could be perhaps more pathogenic than the routine run-of-the-mill strains of equine arteritis virus. A number of years ago there have been various strains that have originated in Europe, been introduced through commercial importers and distributed to mare owners and those mare owners totally unwitting never knew. They knew the stallion it came from but they didn't know what the infective status of that stallion was. They used that semen on their mares and I remember one instance specifically that a certain individual breeder and owner in the northwest of this country literally was bankrupted as a consequence of using such semen and people basically blacklisting any animal that this particular owner tried to sell subsequently, even though they did not represent any risk whatsoever of transmission of infection. It didn't matter. The perception trumped reality. Unfortunately, people weren't willing to listen to scientifically based fact. They allowed their perception to order the day. Um, finally, if one was a breeder and one was intending to purchase such a stallion from abroad, then I think it behooves you to make absolutely certain. It may cost you a certain amount of money to do so. It's money well spent. Second of all, if your stallion turns out to be a non-carrier, a non-shedder, then I would strongly recommend that in fact you consider vaccinating your stallion and maintaining that stallion on a regular program of revaccination throughout its breeding lifespan. Um, the question arises, is it possible that you know additional information may be requested or required on this particular topic? Absolutely. There's a great deal of information in the literature about both the disease and the causal agent. But if individuals need additional information or if specific concerns or questions, then I would be more than prepared to accept either phone calls or emails um, requesting information. I, am, I can be contacted at the University of Kentucky's Gluck Equine Research Center my phone number is area code 859-218-1094 and my email address is ptimony, spelled T-I-M-O-N-E-Y, at uky.edu.